solution for climate from concept to implementation is one of our priority topics that we have been longing to advocate our friends in Asia and the Pacific region and beyond. And actually, this is the very first initiative of ourselves, for ourselves to convene this webinar. So it is my really pleasure, and I thank again all the participants and resource person to make this event available. I think we are all agree that nature-based solutions lie at the heart of our climate change action, and it reinforces the implementation of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the Paris Climate Accord, Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, Convention on Bio Biological Diversity, to name a few among many. It is increasingly advanced as innovative responses to promote adaptation and build resilience. And they are more sustainable with multiple benefits, including conservation of our declining biodiversity. This year, we have already had two important events. One is the seventh Asian Pacific Climate Change Adaptation Forum, which took place in March, and the International Conference on Community-Based Adaptation, CBA, in June, both urges us to consider nature-based solution at the forefront of climate change adaptation, climate change mitigation, and biodiversity conservation. In addition, we will soon have two other important global conferences in the next month, the COP15 on Convention on Biological Diversity, which will be held in China, and the UNFCCC COP26, which will be held in the United Kingdom. Let's hope for a more robust and practical arrangement of actions among the representatives of the governments to expedite climate solutions, including nature-based solutions, and minimize the loss of our biodiversity. I hope all of you will have a very fruitful discussion today and provoke your thoughts in supporting our climate and biodiversity discussion. Once again, I would like to thank all the resource persons and the participants for your valuable contribution for this forum. Now, let me introduce you, my colleague, Fuluba Lenda, Head of Climate Change Cluster, RRCAP, to start the session. Thank you very much, everyone, and best wishes. Purba, you have the floor. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and uh, very good morning from Thailand. Uh, let me firstly uh, join my director in welcoming all of you for this webinar. And we are uh, very much excited to host this webinar today, and we have lots of participants joining us from different parts of the world, and especially of course, from Asia and Asian region. Uh, we have four exciting presentations lined up today, and I hope you'll enjoy. So without uh, wasting our time, I would like to start this webinar today. The webinar today is on nature-based solutions for climate adaptation from concepts to implementation, as you might already know about it. And now uh, you might uh, probably agree that for past few years, we have been hearing are seeing a several global synthesis reports that collectively paints a very bleak picture of the current state of our planet. There is also a general consensus that we are failing to stabilize the climate change and at the same time stop biodiversity loss and degradation. Now, as evidence builds up that our natural ecosystems on which we depend are deteriorating, probably to a point of no return, it is quite clear that a large scale and more coherent approaches to tackling such challenges are really needed. And we are going to talk one such approach today, and that is the nature-based solution for climate change adaptation. Now, for about a decade, innovation has become a sort of a buzzword for every one of us to address challenges related to climate change, biodiversity loss, and a lot of other challenges. Because we talk about innovative technologies, 
innovative projects, innovative ideas, and there are a lot of think tanks around the world thinking about or trying to help us with innovative, innovative ideas. But the fact is that the very simple solution that lie in the nature has not been adequately capitalized. Because so far, I think we have understood nature as a source, as a resource commodity for making money rather than a solution provider. However, with the increasing threats and incidents of climate change and disaster risk reduction, mostly attributed to loss of nature, and of course the recent convergence of COVID-19 pandemic, there has been a growing momentum in considering these nature-based solutions in facing these challenges. However, there are still we don't know a lot about nature-based solutions. And one of the main thing we don't know is, I think probably how to unleash the potential due to lack of knowledge and understanding on how it works and then most importantly, how it benefits us. So in 2020, a study was conducted that was last year by United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction in 24 countries, focusing in America, Europe, Africa, and then in Asia. So the report indicated that there is an adequate lack of uh, knowledge with regard to nature-based solutions implementation in the field, and this is identified as one of the critical needs to address. And also, if we look at some of the global portfolio of climate financing, for example, the GCF funding, according to their report last year, it indicated that only 15% of their funding went to initiatives like nature-based solutions. Of course, this does not mean that GCF does not like to fund, but it is just because that they did not get a very good project to fund. And the stories are quite similar with other funding organizations, for example, like Adaptation Fund, also only funded about 15% of their funding going to a nature-based solution. However, on the other hand, studies have shown that nature-based solutions can potentially provide up to 30% cost-effective global CO2 emission targets by 2030, while limiting warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. The World Economic Forum last year reported that nature-based solutions could unlock an estimated US dollar 10 trillion of business opportunities and could create 395 million jobs by 2030. That is, of course, beyond providing a biodiversity conservation, climate mitigation, and adaptation outcome. So there is, I think, a critical need to address this gap and build awareness around these approaches and started to seek solutions from nature. So how do we do this? We will discuss today in this short session. And we are often sometimes quite obsessed with using varieties of terms to describe nature-based solutions. For example, like building with nature. Some people call it a green infrastructure, ecological engineering, engineering with nature and various other terminologies. And I think to many of us, this is quite confusing. So for that, we need to have a common language and understanding. And that is, of course, the concept because uh, what I mean by nature-based solution should be same, same to other ways, uh, other people as well, especially in terms of submitting, you know, the project implementation in terms of monitoring, implementation, evaluating, uh, reviewing, so and so forth. So we should not let the nature to be exploited in the name of nature-based solution, or in other words, the term nature-based solution should not be misled or uh, misguided so that we can safeguard the nature from over-exploitation and engage stakeholders. And to address this concern, today we'll discuss the concepts and global standards for the nature-based solution. The other important aspect is the traditional ecological knowledge. Now we know that indigenous people have been developing practices based on their traditional knowledge to adapt to climate change. So they hold a very unique position in terms of disaster risk reduction, climate change mitigation, biodiversity conservation, and many other things. So we will try to uncover potentials of traditional ecological knowledge for climate adaptation with some practical examples from the region. And also at present, the implementation of nature-based solutions are predominantly a case specific. As such, information from the past and existing projects can provide valuable information on appropriate designs, implementation techniques, and cost benefit analysis. So we'll discuss some case studies on nature-based solutions implementation in Asia Pacific region. And then finally, the financing part. We all know that financial resources and sound investment are critical in addressing climate change. So where do we get money from? So we will also talk about one of the global funding organization known as uh, Global Ecosystem Adaptation Fund. And the fund has 
was launched last year, and then still the calls are open, and we will hear more uh, on this from our presenters. And now to start with, uh, firstly, uh, I have the honor of inviting our keynote speaker, Mr. Sanjay Bhattaya, who works for United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction based in Incheon in South Korea. So he is connecting us from there. Uh, he's the head of the Office for Northeast Asia and the Global Education and Training Institute for Disaster Risk Reduction. And before taking this position, he worked as the head of International Recovery Platform uh, based in Kobe in Japan. And with, he also worked with World Bank Government of India, United Nations, and he carries a 30 years experience uh, in field of climate change, disaster risk reduction, and you can see more details in the chat box. And thank you, Mr. Sanjay, for your time and supporting this webinar. And I would like to hand over the floor to you, sir. Thank you very much, Fulba, and thank you uh, to the Regional Center for this opportunity. I think it's very timely uh, coming in the in the. Uh, at the period when everyone is preparing for the COP. So um, I just want to quickly address a few issues um, about uh, nature-based solutions and put it in the context of a global framework, uh, which is called the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, which uh, runs from 2015, where that was when the agreement was signed, all the way to 2030, so in, in parallel with uh, uh, Agenda 2030, the SDGs, and the Paris Agreement. Now, Target E of the Sendai Framework uh, talks about substantial increase in the number of countries with national and local disaster risk reduction strategies by, uh, uh, by a period. And this includes the strengthening of economic, social, health, and environmental resilience. So the environmental resilience uh, Going to be achieved only through the nature-based solutions uh, and and this has become an important approach to delivering on the sendai framework uh, so while many of the environmental measures undertaken to reduce disaster risk are not new and they are practiced in many countries there remains a need to build capacity on nature-based solutions i think this webinar also uh, goes a long way in achieving that. Uh, indeed, engineering measures are still more widespread uh, than nature-based solutions. So there is still a big gap. Uh, and as I was also uh, uh, just pointing out a while earlier about the financing, uh, the low level of financing nature-based solutions. Nature-based solutions are essential for sustainable development. They include uh, what we call green spaces, they include wetlands uh, and, and buffers around rivers. Um, the key approach would be designing with nature, uh, especially in disaster prone areas to mitigate the effects of flood and extreme weather events, which we know are going to increase with climate change. So some steps I would like to reflect on, some of the steps that can be taken uh, to ensure that we are designing with First, collect the data to catalog the ecosystem services. So conduct an ecosystem service mapping to understand uh, what are the services uh, within, within the jurisdiction. It could be a city, it could be a district, it could be a province, uh, and utilize this data in the planning process. Address issues of environmental uh, degradation, um, especially in peri-urban areas, because that is where the the nature and uh, human interface is most brutal. So buffer zones, uh, green corridors, they can help to restore the ecological. In cities, try to resolve land titling ambiguities and informal work because poor informal peri-urban areas lack access to public sector, public services and fear titles to land. And as such, the, the expansion that occurs here or the settlements that occur here, they actually worsen the quality of life, making the dwellers vulnerable to environmental hazards and effects of damage. One example I'd like to give of, of a good nature-based solution, and uh, this comes from India in Ahmedabad, where the city built a wall along the river Sabarmati to prevent floods and to protect the environment. Now, 
this the interesting part is that this was all self financed creatively by reclaiming about 200 hectares of riverfront land and 20% of that reclaimed land was sold to finance the entire cost of the project and the rest of the land was used for making parks uh, and and uh, cultural heritage for for students so uh, including a promenade along the banks of the river so so there are many innovative ways that we talk later today about finance Fourth aspect I would say is the, lo uh, the uh, local adaptation plans and planning processes should engage the community members, especially those who are living with the flood um, hazard zones, because the plans that are developed collaboratively uh, are better, more easy to implement. Fifthly, develop land use policies for climate resilience. Um, governments can restrict development in potential flood zone areas and they can also specify resilience measures to be included in in new buildings in these areas which could include uh, aspects of of uh, hfa solution rebuilding restrictions similarly can be uh, imposed uh, in hazardous areas uh, and governments can state that no funding or no investment will be spent in such areas uh, the permitting process uh, should require green infrastructure, so governments uh, allow potential developers to uh, develop certain areas. In that, they can insist that a certain percentage of the area should be green infrastructure. For areas subject to extreme heat, uh, governments can put in uh, requirements for cool roofs, green roofs, uh, and green pavements. And this can be incentivized uh, through uh, rebates or tax credits. Again, investments in transportation should be coupled with integrated land use planning that allows for promotion of walking, cycling, uh, and, and using the natural areas uh, for recreation and uh, health, uh, and also promoting public transportation. Lastly, to invest in built environment improvements for cooling, the government should look at um, energy retrofits, especially in the low income and disadvantaged neighborhoods, because it is the low income populations which are more likely to live in poor housing stock uh, and face energy cost burdens. So, the retrofits which allow um, green roofs and other cooling measures. <clears throat> Uh, would uh, would would help uh, would help those citizens uh, and would be very apt for the aging building stock. So, before I end, I would like to again reiterate that along with the nature-based solutions, one the the key approach is is to integrate the principles of the circular economy, sustainable waste management and materials reuse into all the systems that the governments uh, work with both at the national government level but also and very importantly at the local government level be it cities municipalities districts or states so i think uh, with, with this i would like to end and i look forward to, to the uh, expert uh, presentations on uh, cases and possible solutions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sanjay, for your enriching keynote uh, with regard to nature-based solution, some of the ideas that different countries can adopt, and also um, for the continued uh, support for nature-based solution from the UN, and particularly from the United Nations Disaster Research Reduction Office. So thank you so much for your time, and we really appreciate your uh, keynote here. Thank you so much. Uh, now, I would like to start the technical presentations and I have the pleasure to invite now uh, Ms. Catherine Abimson or Katie, who is the program officer for water and wetland at IUCN regional office uh, here in Thailand. But currently she is connecting us from uh, from New York. Uh, she has uh, several years of experience working on wetlands and nature-based solutions in Southeast Asia. 
and also she has been supporting the Mekong Wet project, uh, which is uh, implemented in the countries of Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. She also supports the Secretariat for Indo Burma Ramsar Regional Initiative to strengthen implementation of Ramsar Convention in the region. And more details you can see uh, post being posted in the chat. So, Kathy, Kathy will talk about the global standard for nature based solution. So, Kathy, please take the floor. Thank you, Purva. Um, so, yeah, as Purva said, I work for the IUCN Asia Regional Office in Bangkok. And today I'll talk about the global standard for nature based solutions. So, a bit of background IUCN has been working on nature based solutions or other uh, related disciplines for quite some time now, working on things like forest landscape restoration and ecosystem based adaptation. And then in 2016, we uh, supported the formal definition and the adoption at the IUCN World Conservation Congress in Hawaii. Since then, we've been working very hard on the development of the Nature Based Solutions Standard, which was adopted by IUCN and has been operationalized by the Secretariat since 2020. So it's still quite a new idea, which is why we're interested in sharing it with you today. So before we get into too much detail, just to share the definition that was adopted in 2016, IUCN defines nature-based solutions as actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges, such as climate change, food or water security, or natural disasters, effectively and adaptively, simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So it's quite a long definition, but it's all important and I'd like to just stress the last part, which is on the human well-being and biodiversity benefits. For us to consider something a nature-based solution, it really needs to be benefiting both of those groups. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Um, so yeah, we took that definition and then we, we used it to feed the development of this nature-based solution standard. So the standard was adopted over multiple rounds of crowdsourcing with hundreds of people across many countries. And what we ended up with is this facilis facilitative standard that will help to um, you know, design and verify and scale up nature-based solutions. We ended up with eight criteria and each criteria has a number of indicators. And these um, are used to help kind of define the criteria and, and further understand uh, the interventions. So looking at the nature-based solutions criteria in more detail, we start with a very kind of straightforward one which is that they need to address societal challenges. Pretty easy, doesn't need a lot of explanation. Criteria two is on making sure that the de design of nature-based solutions is informed by scale. So even if we're working on one site for our intervention, we really need to look around the site and see what else needs to be included. Is there a mangrove forest nearby that gives some downstream benefits to the site? Um, are there communities nearby that don't live in the site but use the site? So we need to consider that when designing the the scale of the project. Um, we want to make sure we take into account all of these factors to enable this longer term durability and sustainability of the solution. Criteria three is on net gain to biodiversity. Criteria four is on economic viability. And cri criteria five is on inclusive and transparent governance processes. So these three are kind of your pillars of sustainability, if you will. They're all incredibly important for designing a nature-based solution, or some would argue any kind of project. Um, but of course, it's it's hard to get the best of all three. So we really need to make sure we are including trade-offs and we're balancing trade-offs because it's very hard to get something that is peak biodiversity, very, very economically viable and very transparent in governance. So we're balancing those trade-offs. We need to understand each time decisions are made, like what is being used today and what is being kept for tomorrow and who's benefiting down the line. And we need to make sure we, we are ensuring transparency in this inclusive decision making when we're balancing these trade offs. If not, we have a high risk of promoting further inequity and marginalization. Criteria seven is on adaptive management. So, especially in the context of this webinar. Uh, ecosystems are already very complex and dynamic, and when you add climate change impacts in, you get even more uh, uncertainty, if you will. So we need to make sure we are considering that. We know that our theories of change are based on a lot of assumptions, and sometimes those assumptions might be wrong. So we need to make sure our project can be changed and adapted as it goes on so that we still are getting a return on investment at the end, and we're still achieving some of our initial goals. 
And finally, uh, the kind of the golden child, the aspirational criteria is criteria eight on sustainable uh, management. And um, this is a tricky one, uh, embedding and institutionalizing nature-based solutions in uh, policy mainstreaming and in integrating them into operational frameworks of governments. And again, grounding them in this community-based government structures really helps them be more durable and long-lasting and helps us to you know, achieve this ambition of nature-based solutions. Um, and, and that's really what we need to do and what we need to focus on and perhaps one of the more difficult ones to achieve. Just to look at some of the criteria in a bit of detail, I don't have time to go through all of them. Of course, we wanna make sure, again, criteria one, that we're addressing these societal challenges. So things like water security, food security, climate change, we can do a lot with nature-based solutions. And I think we just need to broaden our horizons about what can be done. In the bottom, in the blue boxes, you can see three of the indicators for this criteria from the standard. Uh, and the indicators help you to understand exactly what needs to be done for that criteria. So 1.3, indicator 1.3 talks about human well-being arise, outcomes arising from nature-based solutions are identified, benchmarked, and assessed. So we need to make sure we're thinking about that in the design of the nature-based solution and throughout the project. So we can really ensure that it's an effective nature-based solution. Likewise with criteria two, design at scale, uh, you can see some of the um, indicators on the side. One of my favorite indicators uh, is uh, indicator 2.2, which talks about making sure that MBS are integrated with other interventions and looking for synergies across the, se the sectors. We always talk about how we need to break silos and this is a good indicator to make sure your project is working across sectors and really embedded in a network of other nature-based solutions. So quick uh, insight into the actual standard itself. The standard has three main components. First is the standard itself, which has some brief guidance, some indicators, some case studies, and graphics and photos for each criteria. Uh, the second part is the guidance, which provides a bit more scientific context with some rationale for each criteria and indicator, a little bit more in depth, if you will. And the third part is the actual Excel spreadsheet or the assessment itself. So this is a self-assessment tool where you can go through with your uh, intervention that you're planning and you can rank whether it fully, partially, or doesn't meet any of the indicators. So looking at what you would see on the spreadsheet in a bit more detail, this is an example for criteria three, and you have this indicator that the actions are responding to an assessment of the state of the ecosystem and the drivers of degradation and loss. So for each indicator, we have um, some guidance in italics you can see on the right and at the bottom where you can un understand whether you get an idea of what a strong, uh, strong meeting of that criteria would be. So in this example, if you already have an assessment of the site and the assessment is based on local knowledge and field verification, we would say that is strong uh, adherence to that indicator. Whereas if you have never done any assessments, but you're just planning to do a nature-based solution there, you might not meet this one at all. You might be insufficient for this, um, for this particular indicator. So you would go through and you would do this for each of the 28 indicators. And at the end, you would get a, uh, a spider chart that you can see here on the right-hand side of the screen. So in an ideal world, if you have the perfect nature-based solution, you would meet all of these 100% and you'd have a perfect octagon. On this one, you can see the economic feasibility is kind of in towards the center, which means that is something that can be improved. You also uh, return a kind of a stoplight uh, final output where green is good, yellow is, is okay, and red is insufficient. So again, you see the same thing on both of these, um, that the economic feasibility is low. In fact, the uh, score of 0.2 is below the threshold for 0.3, which means the intervention doesn't adhere to the nature uh, to the NBS standard. So then you could go back to that criteria, look at those indicators again, and use that as a way to improve your intervention to try to strengthen it to make it more of a nature-based solution. So that is a very quick run through of the standard itself. And we would like to invite you to join us to go to the IUCN website and to join the user group for nature-based solutions and to provide your feedback. So the standard still is evolving. 
our international standards committee is working on revising the standard with support from the science and knowledge committee who kind of provides this research and evidence base for the revisions. But it is still a living document and we would encourage you if you are planning an NBS or if you would like to test this standard on an ongoing nature based solution to please join and use the uh, self assessment and, and just see how you go with it. We're also working on developing national and regional hubs where we're trying to build in build capacity and strengthen te technical expertise in the Asia region. We're working with China on developing a regional uh, hub for nature based solutions. And we're working, we're in discussions with a few other countries about the potential to develop these as well. So that was quick. There are resources here if you would need them. Um, I understand the organizers are sharing a PDF of all of these uh, PowerPoints. So please feel free to visit the sites, visit the links and learn more. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Katie, for keeping the time. I really appreciate your presentation and yeah, as uh, we will be posting the links in the chat where you can download. Also, I think you can just easily go to IUCN website. There are a whole lot of documents with regard to nature, the solution, including the one that Katie talked about. So thank you, Katie, once again for your wonderful presentation. We really appreciate your support. And our next speaker now is connecting us from all the way from California and USA. And she is Dr. Elizabeth Allison who is an environmental social scientist studying the intersection of religion and ecology. Dr. Allison studies the convergence of religion and ethics with environmental policies and practice through researching traditional ecological knowledge in mountain regions, particularly as it relates to biodiversity, waste, ecological place, and climate change. She is associate professor of the ecology and religion at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, California, where she founded and chairs the graduate program in ecology, spirituality, and religion. She created the Religion and Ecological uh, Ecology Summit series of annual conference, and more details you can find in the chat box. And Dr. Allison will talk about leveraging traditional ecolo ecological knowledge for climate adaptation. So I would like to hand over the floor to you, please. Uh, we cannot hear you. Elizabeth, can maybe un unmute yourself? Yeah, for some reason, I think we yes. cannot hear. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, okay, you speak. already. Um, great. Thank you so much, Purva, for inviting me today. And um, greetings and good morning to Asia and the Pacific from. California, USA, where it is evening now. Um, I'm delighted to share some idea, ideas with you about uh, leveraging traditional ecological knowledge for climate change adaptation. And I, the goal here in my talk is to um, prevent, present a vision of biocultural resilience for climate adaptation, by which I mean really um, following on the previous talk that we're moving toward a situation where both people and nature benefit in reciprocal relations. Um, and it's not only extractive drawing down of nature. So in this talk, I want to define traditional ecological knowledge um, from some academic literature, give a few examples of how it's working in climate change adaptation, and then conclude with the benefits of leveraging traditional ecological knowledge for climate adaptation. Um, so in this talk, I'm drawing on the definition of Fickert Burtz in his book, Sacred Ecology. And he defines traditional ecological knowledge as a commu cumulative body of knowledge, practice, and belief evolving by adaptive processes and handed down through generations of cultural transmission about the relationship of living beings, including humans, with one another and their environments. And we can observe this in a range of situations in the world. Um, uh, traditional knowledge of plants, ethnobotany, knowledge of medic medicinal plants um, and healing modalities. We um, are aware of traditional knowledge of weather and seasonal predictions um, that people who live very close to the land depend on those good seasonal predictions. And of course, climate change is throwing these into question a bit. 
Um, there's traditional ecological knowledge of hunting relationships and wildlife, of land use, um, taboos that um, prevent harvesting of certain plants and animals, and sacred natural sites. And these kinds of traditional ecological knowledge are cumulative, they're developed over time, they're handed down across the generations, they're open to change um, and dynamic. So this is knowledge as a practice and knowledge as lived experience, it's not static knowledge. Um, some of the sources that I'm drawing on here that, are, that I recommend to you are Burke's um, Sacred Ecology, the Archipelago of Hope has a lot of examples of traditional ecological knowledge around the world as different communities confront climate change. Um, and the um, recent IPBES Global Assessment Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services from 2019. Uh, and that report uh, definitely highlights the role of indigenous people in managing biodiversity rich areas. Um, since the 1990s, scholars have been studying traditional ecological knowledge and cultural knowledge, indigenous knowledge, and uh, recognizing that land managed by indigenous peoples has high biological and linguistic diversity, uh, which provides a greater suite of possibilities for addressing novel problems like climate change. To put this into context a little bit, Oftentimes um, in the techno scientific sphere, when we think about ecosystem services, we're thinking about these very material services like nutrient cycling or um, provisioning services, food, water, shelter, as well as the regulating services um, that prevent natural hazards, climates, uh, climate change and floods and disasters. But um, in this talk, I'm really focusing even more on the cultural services that people receive from nature. So the spiritual, religious, recreational, inspirational, aesthetic kind of um, benefits that people get from nature. And these um, benefits, I would argue, are increasingly essential and imperative in an age of climate change when so much around us, even here in California, so much around us is changing unpredictably um, and people need a sense of continuity and a sense of connecting to a tradition, um, a culture, a heritage, uh, arts. Uh, so in these ways, cultural services are increasingly important. So some examples of uh, traditional ecological knowledge in climate change resilience include the example of the protests um, to protect uh, sacred lands and waters in the northern U.S. Um, the Lakota Sioux um, uh, protested a, uh, against the um, uh, Dakota Access Pipeline that was to be built in North Dakota and rallied indigenous people from around the world uh, to join them. They employed both political action and direct action as well as prayers and rituals and were able to uh, halt the building of this um, fossil fuel pipeline for a while, then it was allowed to go forward and now it's under further environmental review. But these folks were pulling on both the uh, moral authority of their spiritual practice as well as drawing on uh, political means to defend lands and waters. I mentioned the um, IPBES report earlier. This is a slide from that report. It points out that indigenous people manage about um, a quarter of um, land that has uh, of extant biodiversity, uh, a, a great deal of biodiversity. Um, and there's an overlap between indigenously managed lands, formally designated protected areas, and areas with very low human intervention. That, that's shown in the, um, in the three circles in the center of this slide. So pointing out that there's an overlap between uh, lands that indigenous people manage and lands with high biodiversity. And so just to give you a few examples of different possibilities of 
involving traditional ecological knowledge in climate adaptation. Um, we hear um, here on the, in the coastal areas, we hear about managed retreat and the need for some uh, cities to move inland away from the coastal areas. In Kumik, uh, Zanskar, India, a village, the village of Kumik did its own managed retreat um, when the glacier that they depended on for water uh, retreated and the river that they depended on uh, was moved farther away from the village as the glacier retreated. Uh, this story is recounted in this excellent book, Fire and Ice by Jonathan Mingle. And eventually the village came together and developed their own plan for managed retreat. They developed their own plan to move the village to a new er area that would be closer to water. So I think when uh, policymakers and uh, program managers are working together with local people, these sorts of examples where local groups exert their own agency and determine how their village is going to move forward are very powerful. I think there's a lot more um, efficacy, self-efficacy and resilience in making that choice themselves rather than having that um, imposed upon them. Not everyone in this village was happy about the choice to move, but they all realized collectively and communally that they did have to move because their water source had dried up. Another example of traditional ecological knowledge um, is this idea of creating an ice stupa for water storage. Um, this comes from Ladakh, India. Um, so the, a stupa is um, a Buddhist um, religious uh, structure. Um, and in this location, people have been experimenting with piling up ice and snow during the winter into these very large mounds uh, so that it will slowly melt and slowly reduce, release water uh, in the spring and summer when that water is needed for the crops. And there is um, some historical precedent that they're drawing on here in developing this really creative idea for uh, having water availability throughout the spring and summer. So I think, again, drawing on the, the creativity and ingenuity of local people can be very powerful in climate adaptation. Another example from California um, is the use of uh, traditional ecological knowledge about fire in fire adapted landscape. Um, here in California, the landscape needs to burn every few years. It's a fire adapted landscape, but for the past hundred years, fire has been suppressed um, and more and more buildings have been constructed. The state has become very urbanized, um, but this has meant a very large buildup of fuels. And when wildfires do break out, as they have recently, you may have read in the news, they get out of control. They get very hot, um, very dangerous, and they spread wildly. Uh, so there's an effort to bring back the traditional ecological knowledge of regular low scale, small scale burning um, to clear out these excess fuels and maintain the landscape in um, a, a bit of a safer manner. We can also think of um, religious and spiritual knowledge and traditional ecological knowledge. So in research that I did in the Himalayas, I learned about uh, spirits um, found in water springs that uh, cause people to keep the area around the spring very clean and free of contaminants. Um, so that maintains their water source in a healthy condition um, in Nepal. Similarly, in Bhutan, um, in some areas, it's believed that there are local spirits um, in the forest or in the mountain and people should not trespass on these areas. So in this photo, you can see um, the large trees in the center, that's the area where a uh, spirit is believed to live. And um, this can maintain the biodiversity and the forest quality in this area. And then finally, resilient housing is another challenge in, um, in the climate change era. Um, again, in the United States, you know, we've seen some serious storms in the last couple of weeks and flooding. And so how do we build resilient housing that can withstand all these perturbations from climate. Um, in Bhutan, the tradition of rammed earth is one type of resilient housing that draws on local available materials, very sustainable. 
um, here in the United States, another option is um, this um, experimental site called Earthship Biotexture in New Mexico, where they're using all reclaimed and recycled materials to build these houses uh, and to try to make them very sustainable over time, but also very sturdy and um, weather hardy. And so overall, I've offered some examples um, just to provoke your thinking and provoke creativity when you're working with local groups um, to consider how to draw on traditional ecological knowledge. This has a lot of benefits. Um, it can unleash the creativity of local people. It draws on the local genius of the place that is built on long-term knowledge and observation. It engages historical and place-based knowledge um, where people understand specific difficulties at the local level. They know what their local priorities are. It also contributes to preserving intangible heritage and cultural knowledge um, and builds on the specific knowledge of place-based opportunities and challenges. And it's, there's also the opportunity to build equity across difference by engaging multiple stakeholders in uh, efforts to engage traditional ecological knowledge. It can incorporate the views of girls and women who are often um, experiencing the worst um, effects of climate change Stakeholder input um, leads to greater buy-in to solutions and uh, climate change adaptation uh, projects. And finally, psychological science tells us that agency, consent, and self-direction uh, give people a greater sense of efficacy and control. And with climate change bringing so many unpredictable and unprecedented catastrophic events, the sense of control um, and efficacy will be very important to building psychological well-being. So people have a sense of choosing their path rather than having it forced upon them. So in conclusion, uh, incorporating traditional ecological knowledge into climate change ad adaptation can um, build both more resilient ecosystems and more resilient human beings. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Allison, for your wonderful presentations, uh, especially I think those, uh, the applications in the field, I think these are really exciting, which can be replicated, although it has been already been used, but I think we need a lot of upscale in this uh, kind of an area. So thank you so much for your wonderful presentation and your, for, for your time. It is such, such a old timing for you there, but we really appreciate your support for this. So now we move on to our next presentation and the, our next presenter joins from Australia in Sydney. So actually, we don't have any of our speakers sitting here in Thailand, although we are hosting this from Thailand today. And it's raining quite heavily outside now. So pardon me if you if there is a noise disruption from here. It's been raining uh, quite heavy in Thailand for a while. So we have uh, Miss Catherine Michi connecting us from Australia, and Catherine is a senior advisor, a conservation impact for WWF Asia and Pacific, and she supports, uh, supports strategy development, strengthening program quality, and improving measurement of conservation impact. Uh, Catherine has always strived to place people at the center of conservation solutions and is particularly excited about potentials for nature-based solutions to put nature at the center of human challenges. Catherine has several years of experience in leading conservation and development projects and programs across Asia Pacific, uh, with WWF for last week yet. Uh, more details you can see posted there in the chat box. And then Catherine will talk about uh, community adaptation pathways, nature-based experience from Asia Pacific region. And just for information, uh, WWF has just launched a new report, uh, Powering Nature, Creating the Conditions to Enable Nature-Based Solutions. And we are very ex much excited to share this link. We haven't read it, but we are very much excited to link. So I would like to hand over the floor to Catherine, please. Thank you so much, Baba, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Um, when I first learned about nature-based solutions, I was so excited. It brings together those three issues that I'm most passionate about, which I think are most important for our world today. 
of course, addressing climate change, but also drawing in the need to improve biodiversity conservation, while also looking at human well-being impacts and making sure we're working with local communities and people effectively. So I love the way it brings the three of those together. They're intrinsically connected and we're no longer considering them in isolation. Now, WWF has five key principles that I'd like to share with you when designing effective nature-based solutions. Um, the first is making sure that our nature-based solutions that we're working on really relate, result in genuine change, whether that's climate change mitigation or climate change adaptation. This is particularly important when we're looking at the mitigation nature-based solution approaches, making sure that they're not replacing or compensating for ongoing pollution and emissions in other sectors. Secondly, they need to be informed by science and based on the best available data that we have. Thirdly, they need to be synergistic. So as I said, bringing together the climate, the human well-being, and the biodiversity impacts so they're not being considered in isolation. Importantly, number four, we need to be co-designing these with our local stakeholders, particularly Indigenous people and local communities. And finally, we need to make sure they're measurable and traceable. And we have really robust monitoring, reporting, and evaluation systems in place. So I'm going to share two examples with you today. The first is a pilot that I worked on in the Solomon Islands. We called it Community Adaptations Pathways in Solomon Islands, or CAPSI. And CAPSI in of itself is not a nature-based solution but it was an excellent tool for engaging with communities to help them understand nature-based solutions. So anyone who has spent time in the Pacific knows how vulnerable the Pacific, including Solomon Islands, is to climate change. This is not something that's going to be happening in the future. It's happening here, it's happening now. The impacts from sea level rise, seeing this saltwater intrusion coming in, affecting agriculture and food security, seeing more frequent and intense extreme weather events, and as we're seeing sea temperatures rise, we're seeing coral bleaching, loss of fish stocks, and that's also affecting food security. We work with a great range of partners for this pilot. We had two science partners, the Australian National University and CSIRO. CSIRO is Australia's national science body. So it was really great to access their deep expertise. Then we also worked with two development partners, uh, Plan International Australia, and Solomon Islands Development Trust. And they brought so much valuable value to the project, especially in, in terms of helping WWF improve our gender equality and social inclusion practice. So making sure when we're working with the communities, we're listening to the men, the women, the boys, the girls, the youth, the elderly, people with disabilities, making sure we're considering their different perspectives, capturing their voices and responding to everybody's needs. And the real strength of this project was really accessing that deep traditional knowledge that Elizabeth just talked about and empowering communities to drive their own adaptation. And then combining that with the best practice adaptation science that we're able to access through the Australian National University and CSIRO, that meant that climate change adaptation wasn't so much something being done to communities coming from the top down, which is traditionally what we've seen in the Pacific. So we spend a lot of time working with community members to really understand what are the local natural resources that they depend on. And we scored them all in terms of importance for income, health, food security, and also very importantly, culture, making sure we really understood what was important to the people we're working with. And then this was combined with the data and modeling from CSIRO, looking at a range of possible solutions uh, futures and possible climate change impacts in the future. So that looked at likely sea level rise, inundation risk, future changes in rainfall, and also modeling different possible trends of population change. Because obviously your number of people living there also affects your ability to adapt. But it was really important for us to understand what are the impacts going to be on those natural resources that our communities identified as important to them. So bringing these two pieces of knowledge together. And we went through a really facilitated, inclusive process where we explored these five points. 
The first was understanding about the drivers of change, and that's not just climate change, but also population growth, economic shocks. We did this right before the COVID pandemic, so it was really interesting to see how the communities that we'd worked with cope differently to a COVID response versus um, the other communities in the area. Um, also, bringing the community together to develop a shared vision for what they want for their community in the future. And this is where PLAN and SIDT's expertise is so important to make sure we were capturing the voices of a diverse range of people in the community. Um, then mapping out possible future scenarios for the community. As I said, we, climate change is so unpredictable. We don't know exactly how bad it might get, but making sure you know, we were mapping different possible scenarios. Then looking at the adaptive capacity of the community today and taking a real strength-based approach. Quite often when we're doing climate change at work, we come in with a vulnerability assessment, which can be quite disempowering. Um, so we kind of flipped this on its head and looked at all the strengths and the assets that the community has that will help them adapt to change in the future. Then using all of this analysis, we worked with them to develop no regret strategies to achieve that vision. And this concept of no regrets was so important. It needed to be robust to a range of different climate scenarios. For example, if you install a seawall, that helps a certain level of sea level rise. But if the sea level rise rises above that sea wall, you lose that entire investment. But if you invest in nature-based solutions like mangroves or restoration, then that's going to help you adapt to climate change, no matter how bad the climate change gets. Then the second example I'm going to share with you today is the new Resilient Asian Deltas Initiative. So this touches on three care areas, increasing resilience to climate change, improving the health of major rivers, but very importantly, protecting the livelihood of millions of people and all of our investments in infrastructure in the landscape. This initiative is focused on six key del deltas across seven countries, um, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, and China. And I wish I could spend longer on this slide. There is a lot here, but they'll be shared with you later. But the key point I want you to take away from this is that deltas are under threat even before we're considering climate change. Those things happening in the delta itself, as well as upstream. So activities like poorly planned hydropower dams or unsustainable sand mining are actually stopping the sediment that is so critical for the health of the deltas to flow down the river and deposit in the delta the way it's meant to. So even without climate change and sea level rise, we were observing some deltas retreating because of this lack of sedimentation flowing down, retreating by several meters every year. And then when you add local impacts in the delta itself and the climate change impacts, deltas are really vulnerable. But if we get this right, and if we do this well, we're gonna have some amazing impacts increasing the resilience of the most vulnerable people in communities, improving food and water security, making sure we're protecting our built environment and infrastructure, and of course, increasing the resilience of the ecosystems and associated ecosystem services themselves. And although the Resilient Asian Deltas initiative is focused on adaptation, there's also huge potential for reduced emissions from land use change and restoration. I'm going to end with a very tangible example of an activity which is part of this Resilient Asian Delta Initiative, which is um, in the Mekong Delta in Vietnam, a model of integrated and shrimp and rice. So as many of you would know, the Mekong Delta is the rice bowl of Vietnam. It's so critical for food security across the region. The traditional rice pro production is increasingly under threat from climate change, largely due so not just the sea level rise itself and the flooding, but the saltwater intrusion associated with that. So WWF is working on a pilot with some farmers to integrate this rice and shrimp model. That, and this model works with these natural flooding and salination cycles that they're seeing in the Delta, rather than working against these natural flows and these natural flooding cycles. So in the freshwater season, enough fresh water is flowing from upstream 
then it means that the rice can still grow effectively during that year. You're not seeing that salt water intrusion into the soil, which is stopping the rice from growing. That can still be done for part of the year from September to December. And at the same time, in those spaces between the rice paddies, farmers are able to grow giant shrimp. But during the period of saltwater intrusion, then they can use the brackish water and produce um, shrimp across the um, farmed area. The other advantage to this, as well as working with nature, is that it's diversifying income streams for vulnerable farmers and that they can also access price premiums because they can apply for certified organic rice production and also apply for certification from ASC, which is the Aquaculture Stewardship Council. So it's really creating these resilient revenues and meaning it's a bankable nature solution that has this internal rate of return. So I know I've covered a lot there. Thank you so much, Dagi Abdulmat and Thinkaman. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Catherine, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, we really appreciate your time. It's very nice to see some of the great examples that WWF has shown, especially in terms of nature-based solutions being implemented in Asia Pacific region. I think audience have enjoyed your presentation, so thank you so much. And now we move to the last presentations. Uh, last, of course, not the least. Uh, we have our final speaker uh, joining us from Washington, D.C. I'm sorry, Emily, that I think it's already uh, probably past midnight there in Washington, D.C. So thank you for bearing with us and thank you very much for support. And we really, really appreciate your support for us. Uh, by the way, Emily Goodwin, who works as it works as program officer at the uh, IUCN Washington, D.C. office. Uh, and she supports the development and implementation of IUCN a global portfolio of projects on nature based solutions and resilience. And this includes the coordination of Friends of Ecosystem Based Adaptation, a global collaborative network of plus 90 agencies and organizations working to synthesize multi stakeholder uh, knowledge on EBA. And Emily also supports the steering and operation of the Global Fund for Ecosystem Based Adaptation, for which she will be talking now. So I would like to hand over the floor to you, please. Hello, everyone, and thank you for, for that introduction. Um, my name is Emily Goodwin, as Ferba shared, and I work for IUCN's Global Ecosystem Based Adaptation Team based in Washington, D.C. IUCN is extensively involved in supporting and implementing climate change adaptation projects around the world through nature based solutions. From 2015 to date, IUCN has implemented and supported over 100 nature based solutions for adaptation projects in 94 countries with a total funding volume of over 200 billion euros in investments. And as we've heard from all of our excellent speakers today, there's increasing global recognition and evidence that healthy, resilient ecosystems lay the foundation for sustainable development, food and water security, disaster risk reduction, and climate action. Yet this approach is not mainstreamed across the climate development and infrastructure sectors. So how can we change that? As part of this work in 2019, the German International Climate Initiative committed 20 million euros to IUCN and UNEP for the upscaling of EBA through the development of the Global Fund for Ecosystem-Based Adaptation, which is a funding mechanism that provides targeted seed capital for innovative and catalytic approaches to EBA. So if we can go to the next slide. So, so quickly, um, I wanted to go over what we mean when we are talking about EBA. Um, as we were reminded by the last IPCC report, the urgent need for adaptation to the accelerating impacts of climate change for both human communities and ecosystems has never been more clear. So ecosystem-based adaptation is, is a nature-based solution that harnesses biodiversity and ecosystem services to re reduce vulnerability and build resilience of human communities to climate change. EBA encompasses a broad set of approaches that include the management of ecosystems and ecosystem services to reduce the vulnerability of human communities, such as the conservation, sustainable management, and restoration of ecosystems, such as forests, grasslands, wetlands, mangroves, coral reefs, to reduce the harmful, harmful impacts of climate hazards, including shifting patterns or levels of rainfall, changes in maximum and minimum temperatures, stronger storms, or increasingly variable climatic conditions. So next slide. 
The purpose of the Global EBA Fund is largely to support catalytic initiatives and build a portfolio of evidence to overcome global barriers to upscaling EBA. The three key global barriers that we set out to address can be summarized as follows. One, a lack of awareness of the critical role of natural assets in underpinning, uh, in underpinning climate resilience and limited availability of knowledge, data, and evidence to help make the case for working with nature. Two, policy and regulatory environments and governance challenges that limit the attractiveness and feasibility of using these approaches. And three, limited access to finance for applying and scaling up nature based approaches. The fund is unique but in that we do not have a regional or thematic focus. Instead, we're setting out to prioritize filling resourcing and knowledge gaps with a broad focus on innovation and urgency. We encourage creative solutions and partnerships among funding applicants in the EBA community to address research gaps, pilot innovative new approaches engage in strategic policy mainstreaming and incentivize innovative finance mechanisms and catalyze private sector investment. The fund aims to break down the silos between gray and green adaptation options, move beyond the status quo of business as usual adaptation and move towards integrated measures that optimize for adaptation effectiveness, cost, durability, sustainability, and co-benefits for people in nature. Next slide. Um, and here to get into the very concrete pieces, because we don't have a set regional or thematic focus for projects. We often get this question. So what, what are you funding? Um, so very quickly in summary, um, we support projects that meet the globally, def the globally accepted definition of EBA that result in catalytic impact and that add value to or upscale existing work. So we expect global EBA fund grants to be complementary to um, work that's already ongoing by either filling a gap in an existing project, enhancing the impact of an existing um, investment in EBA, contributing to policy upscaling of EBA, um, or serving to develop a larger proposal to another funding mechanism. Projects may be global, thematic, regional, or country specific. Um, or some projects have no on ground focus at all. If the project does have a country specific focus, it must be targeted to 1 or more countries, which are el eligible for official development assistance. Um, very quickly, when we say catalytic impact, um, this often includes, or some of the, some of the projects that have been proposed to us, this, um, includes piloting innovative or unproven approaches to EBA. Removing barriers nationally from upscaling EBA interventions at the policy level, um, supporting innovative finance mechanisms, and incentivizing private sector investment. And when we talk about adding value to existing work, the projects at this relatively small funding volume of 50,000 to 250,000 USD um, are, should not be standalone interventions. They should be inter in distinctly um, distinctly scaling up something that is already ongoing, filling a gap in something that's exists in, in an existing project, addressing specific knowledge gaps or enhancing the impact of existing investments. Projects should always leverage existing knowledge standards, partnerships, experiences, and best practices. And while field implementation may be a component of a project, um, the projects will, should not focus only on field implementation of a brand new intervention. Next slide. The fund is seeks to reach out beyond traditional actors and constituencies to attract different act, um, to attract different actors relevant to EBA and climate change adaptation that may not often be receiving this type of climate financing. The fund seeks diverse applicants with relevant experience and local partnerships and presence and who support addressing specific gaps in technical knowledge and understanding among government actors. However, it's worth noting that um, in line with current um, ICCI policies in the German um, Climate Initiative, we cannot grant directly to government partners. And next slide. Um, very quickly to share that the fund is a rolling program. We're accepting and reviewing submissions year round with biannual funding decisions and announcements. 
The second cutoff for concept notes is just around the corner next week, September 15th. But if you are interested in the opportunity and can't make that deadline, any concept note submitted after that date will be will will be considered in the next round, which with a cutoff date of um, February 28th next year. And go to the final slide and just to share that for any further details, I'll drop these links in the chat as well. But the formal grant procedures manual um, is available on our website at www.globalebafund.org. Um, and for any specific questions on how to apply, as well as documentation and news related to the fund, um, that will all be available on the website as well. Um, we also encourage you to stay tuned for the announcement of our first 10 recipients, which will be um, announced in the following weeks, um, as far as in, including details about those projects and recipients. Um, thank you very much for having me, and please let me know in the chat if there are any questions about the fund. Uh, thank you so much, Emily, for your wonderful presentation and letting our audience know about this funding. So I think the call is still open. It is year round accepting applications. So I would encourage all of you to apply. This is such a good catalytic fund, I think, in terms of uh, upscaling different kinds of projects. So thank you very much for your presentation, Emily. And now we have finished with our, we are done with our presentations from our panelists and we have a short time for Q&A session. So I'll be basically, as I said before, picking up questions from the Q&A box. I've been seeing some questions uh, being posted in the chat box as well, but I have requested my colleagues to uh, put it back in the Q&A box. So I will just start with the Q&A session now. Um, there is, uh, I'll be just looking at some of the general question, not specific one in the interest of time so that it can uh, benefit the larger audience. So there is a, Question on the knowledge on ecosystem. So I think uh, this, uh, sorry, this question, uh, yes, this question actually is from Peter King. I know Peter King actually. Thank you so much, Peter King, for your question. Um, and he's asking like the knowledge of ecosystem and ecological dynamics of those uh, ecosystem should underpin decision to apply a nature-based solution. However, the capacity, especially in Asia Pacific region is very uh, limited. Now, uh, how can we enhance that uh, capacity, especially in this part of the world to enhance, you know, when you implement this uh, uh, kind of a solution or initiatives, uh, we definitely need to have a very strong technical background to execute those uh, initiatives. So uh, the question is that how can we sort of like, what are some of the ideas that you think based on your experience or from your work or knowledge, like how do you think we can a sort of like uh, uh, help these capacities here in this region. So anybody is uh, free to speak. I think I cannot ask any specific uh, panelists at the moment. Uh, I can share a bit from, from our work with IUCN in the region. Um, one of the things we're doing uh, with our Mekong wet project, which focuses on wetlands and ecosystem based adaptation in wetlands is we developed a uh, intensive training program where we took university professors from five countries in uh, the Indo-Burma region. So Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Myanmar. And we did an intensive training with the professors in English. And then we sent them back to their countries to do the same training, but in their local languages. So it was kind of a capacity building where the training was initially very small, but then was able to kind of expand exponentially to more people. So we found that that has been very useful. That model we call it the training, train the trainers model. Um, and of course, it doesn't give them, you know, all of the technical expertise, but they that they need. But you know, if some some groups are focusing on wetlands, other groups are focusing on EVA or MBS and other ecosystems, it can be a very helpful way to to build knowledge and capacity. Uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, would any of the panelists wanted to add on this? Okay, please go ahead. I'll just add as well. Um, I think it's really important to not just rec uh, recognize Western science and Western approaches, knowledge of ecosystems, but also acknowledging that deep traditional knowledge that local communities will have and making sure we're building on that. Somebody doesn't necessarily need to have gone to university to really have deep knowledge there. I think recognizing the different forms of knowledge. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Catherine. 
Uh, some most of the questions are being answered by panelists in the chat box. So thank you very much for your proactive reactions. Uh, there's one question talking about this is a kind of a general question asking like, is a uh, human behavior or attitude? It's a hurdle to nature based solution. So I would, if you don't mind, I would like to put this question to Dr. Allison, since you have been working with uh, university students and also with a number of other agencies for your research, uh, especially in terms of traditional knowledge and uh, application of uh, this uh, traditional uh, knowledge and adaptations. So, if I may put this question to you, is the human behavior a big hurdle in this application? I think it is, and I also think it's a hurdle that um, we can leap over, but it takes um, attention and training, if I can continue to use the uh, exercise metaphor. Um, I. I think that what one of the key themes that we've heard from all the panelists today is how interconnected human well-being is with our natural ecosystems and our surroundings. Um, and I think that's, in the United States anyway, something that is often forgotten and, and kind of where I start with my students is to remember that we are nature, we are the cosmos, we are the universe. and. Um, so when we are caring for nature, we're caring for ourselves. Um, and I think that this is actually something that all of us can do, whether we're at a university or an organization or just in our household, is that we can help each other remember that taking care of nature is taking care of ourselves. It's a responsibility that all of us have. Um, in the US that has, has fled very far from our minds, especially over the last four unfortunate years of um, our administration here. So, so yeah, I do think that uh, human behavior is a big challenge, um, but I think that when, especially children are often very connected to nature and, um, you know, believe they can talk with plants and animals and really are curious to learn. So I think all of us can also nurture that curiosity and appreciation and wonder um, and build um, that capacity and maintain that capacity for kids to care for nature wherever they are um, and grow into then adults who advocate for nature and nature-based solutions. Uh, I'm sure other you. panelists have uh, ideas as well. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I would like to ask a question to uh, Catherine from WWF, uh, my question to you is like, since you have talked about your experience in nature based solution implementation in Asia Pacific regions and with a lot of experience, I would actually, I think it will be even important for our. For me, of course, uh, definitely for me and also for all the audience here that what are some of the risks associated with nature based solutions and how can we manage these risks? Thank you so much. It's such an important question to make sure we're designing our nature based solutions to manage those risks from the very beginning. Um, I think one of the biggest risks for nature based solutions, especially some of the mitigation ones, is the fact that it has the potential to displace um, really important and significant and urgent action to reduce emissions elsewhere. So we need to see nature-based solutions as something in addition to, rather than instead of mitigating emissions elsewhere. Um, there's also when we're working with land use planning and everything for um, eco-system based adaptation, there's a huge risk of displacement of indigenous people and local communities. So it's, that's why it's really important to be working really closely with them from the beginning to make sure our solutions are co-designed and we have that joint ownership we're responding to the needs and the concerns of not just the directly affected community members, but anybody else who may use those resources. Um, and in recent years, WWF has just introduced a new environmental and social safeguards framework. So that provides WWF with a really strong, robust um, management plan for making sure we're being proactive in identifying those risks and then managing to reduce them. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, I would like to ask a question to Emily now. One question regarded, uh, with regard to the funding. Um, 
is is there some sort of a criteria where you think uh, where you have like more funding opportunity if you take a regional approach or kind of a transboundary work is that some sort of a criteria in winning the proposal in the uh, in the funding uh, criteria it's not a specific criteria that we have for the global EBA fund, but first, but for some of those larger transboundary projects, I, I always encourage people to follow the um, German international climate initiative. Um, regional regional thematic calls for proposals, which are at a larger funding volume of up to 20 million per call. Um, but 1 of the things that might be an opportunity with the EBA with the EBA fund and sort of this smaller pot of funding would be to. Um, support the development of that larger transboundary proposals to gather the data that you need to develop this broader catalytic project. And that's sort of what we would be able to set out to do with the fund is help get that work started, help get the actors moving on the ground. Okay, uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, it's just about the time to close. Uh, so, one last question. There's a uh, in the question. Chat box. Is there a large scale carbon capture storage system based on ecological or nature based solutions? So I think it is asking like, is there a kind of an example where because of the implementation of nature based solution or is, has there been a big headway in capturing carbon system? I, yeah, I'm not re really sure about this question, but this is how I think. So would Katie like to answer this one? Um, I'm not sure that I, I, is the question asking. I'm not sure if the question is asking about technology. I think, uh, from, from what we've learned, of course, the, the best solution is to, is to keep the ecosystem healthy to begin with. They are the best at capturing carbon and, and reducing it from, from going out into the, into the atmosphere from, from the source. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any other, any other panelists want to chime in, please feel free. Yeah, I think I would like to welcome yeah other panelists. If you I would any... I would quickly echo what Catherine from WWF said earlier that um, you know there is a lot of potential for mitigation opportunities through nature based solutions, but this is not supposed to be separate. This is not supposed to be instead of carbon emissions reductions across all sectors. And I think that's a very critical point in our communicating about nature-based solutions that we need to make sure, Kath and I like how you framed it as this needs to be in addition to, not instead of. Uh, would anyone like to add or? It seems oh, please, like please go ahead. maintaining forests is um, carbon capture, right? So. It, certainly, there are social uh, factors that have to be balanced, um, but maintaining um, healthy forests is, you know, that's the, nature's original carbon capture technique. So, and healthy oceans too, of course. You're muted. We can't hear you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> So we would like to end this now. Uh, I would especially like to thank our panelists for your wonderful presentations, and we really appreciate your time and effort joining us on this webinar. And before we conclude, I would like to request all the participants to check on the link posted uh, in the chat box. Please give us some feedback on this webinar so that we can try to improve in the future. So, if you don't mind, before you exit, please kindly uh, give us some feedback. The link has been posted just now. So, I think uh, you have enjoyed this webinar. I think it has been useful to all of you. Uh, we have learned that uh, nature offers uh, many attractive possibilities for responding to climate challenges. But uh, we must, I think, also be very careful not to oversell this term nature-based solutions. You know, sometimes the term uh, solutions often permits a perception that it promotes a kind of a quick and tidy outcome, but in reality, the solutions are, I think, sort of an ongoing process that requires dedicated efforts to revisit and learn from the process, the past implementation, so and so forth. So I think it is vital for us to get the message right about what the concept of nature uh, 
this solution comprises. I'm very happy to see a lot of questions in the chat box, especially related to the uh, the concept and the global standard of nature-based solutions. So there are a lot of documents we can uh, refer. And we all know that, you know, the protecting our nature should be at the heart of our planning for everything else we do, which recognizes that uh, healthy ecosystem are foundation for resilient societies. And as we look to a world with a greater risks and greater uncertainty now, with climate change, and also now we all know with the COVID-19, it is probably, I think, the nature that would offer important solutions while we are facing such crisis. So I think uh, going forward, I think investing in nature-based solution could be one of the smartest thing I think we can, uh, we could sort of take to secure our future and achieve sustainable development goals. And what we do or what we don't do now, I think will determine to a large extent the fate of our planet. So finally, uh, we hope that this webinar has provided you with some ideas to march ahead as we forge a uh, complete uh, sort of a new relationship now between people and planet. You know, now we have been going through this period of pandemic, so the relationship with the planet is very different from what we have foreseen before. And we hope that this will help you design a robust plan, resilient plan for the climate adaptation, uh, incorporating nature-based solutions, and the urgent challenges of, and address the urgent challenges of climate breakdown and biodiversity loss. I think we must now act all, I think uh, very soon our nature's ability to provide essential services for us will be diminished and the climate change and biodiversity crisis might probably intensify in the future. So once again, I would like to thank you everyone for joining and especially to the panelists for taking their time despite the time difference. We really appreciate your support. And lastly, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the Ministry of Environment Government of Japan for their continuous support for our program in accelerating adaptation support in Asia Pacific region. And I would also like to thank our uh, colleagues here working in the office for helping us with this webinar. webinar. So we will see you in our next webinar. We have a series of web webinar coming up and which will be announced soon. And the soonest one would be on the topic centered around uh, making our city resilient from disaster and climate change risks. So I would like to wish you all have a great day or a great evening and thank you so much. Please kindly complete the feedback survey as you leave the room. So thank you once again. No, it's only. Uh, for those who are in the process of filling up the feedback from, forms, please take your time. We will be closing in five minutes, so please uh, kindly take your time to fill up the forms. <laughs>